champions and happy Monday. Today we are reading through chapter three of One Day in the Desert by Jean Craighead George. Without further ado, you know the drill. After this you'll have five to ten questions to answer about what we read in the story. Some of the things that we might be asked about are characters in the story, the setting of the story, thinking about scientific facts and how animals adapt to live in the harsh desert environment. Okay, so thank you for doing your best on chapters one and two. Without further ado, let's get started on chapter three. Chapter three. On July 10th, the wounded mountain lion was forced to hunt in the heat of the day. He could not wait for darkness. He made his way slowly down the trail toward the Papago Indian hut. By 9 a.m., he was above the dwelling on a mountain ledge. The temperature climbed another degree. He sought the shade of a giant saguaro cactus and lay down to rest. The scent of a lion reached the nose of a coyote who was cooling off under the dark embankment of the dry river not far from the Papago Indian hut. He lifted his head, flicked his ears nervously, and got up to his feet. He ran swiftly into his burrow beneath the roots of the ancient saguaro cactus that grew beside the hut. The huge cactus was over 100 years old, stood 75 feet tall, and weighed more than six tons. Think about that. Every time you're driving through the desert and you see the giant saguaro cactus standing tall with their arms, they're 75 feet tall. They're huge. They weigh six tons. They weigh as much as a semi-truck. They're big, okay? The last of its watermelon red fruits were ripe and on the ground. Birdwing and her mother were going to gather them and boil them in the water that they had carried in buckets from the village. The fruit makes a sweet, nourishing syrup. At 11 a.m., they stretched out on their mats in the hut. It was much too hot to work. The temperature had reached 112 degrees Fahrenheit, or 44.4 degrees Celsius. The old cactus was drying up in the heat. It drew on the last of the water in the reservoir inside its trunk and shrank ever so slightly, for it could expand and contract like an accordion. The mountain lion's tongue was swollen from lack of moisture. He got to his feet again. A roadrunner, a ground-dwelling bird with a spiny crest and a long neck and legs saw the lion pass a shady spot in the grass. He sped down the mountain over the riverbank and into the dry river bed. He stopped under the embankment where the coyote had been. There he lifted his feathers to keep cool. Bird feathers are perhaps the best protection from both heat and cold for they form dead air space and dead air space is one of the best insulations. So when birds lift their wings, they don't allow any wind or anything to build up under their wings. So if they cover like this, that dead air it doesn't allow for heat to get in or for cold to, to leave. So think of that. There might be a question when we see something that's highlighted. Think, maybe I'll see this in the future, okay? The Roadrunner passed a family of seven peccaries. They're pig-like animals with coarse coats, tusks, and almost no tails. They stay alive in the dry desert by eating the water-storing prickly pear cactus, spines, and all. They were lying in the cool of the Palo Verde trees that grow in thickets. Like the pencil straight ocotil, 
and almost all the desert leafy plants, the Palo Verdes drop their leaves when the desert is extremely hot and dry. On July 10th, they began falling faster and faster. The scent of the lion reached the old boar. He lifted his head and watched the great beast. The lion turned aw away from the peccary family and limped toward the Indian hut. All the pigs, big and little, watched him. A warm, moist wind that had been moving northwest across the Gulf of Mexico for a day and a night met a cold wind blowing east from the Pacific Coast Mountains. The hot and cold air collided not far from the Mexico-Arizona border and exploded into a chain of white clouds. The meeting formed a stiff wind. So this paragraph's highlighted because it's telling us about the phenomenon of weather. When we have hot air and cold air pushing against each other, they start to make clouds. And when we've got clouds, what do you think we get after that? Okay. It picked up the desert dust and carried it toward Mount Scorpion. As the lion limped across the embankment under which the roadrunner was hiding, the air around him began to fill with dust. Near the coyote den dwelled a tarantula, a spider with as big, that is almost as big as a man's fist and covered with fur-like hairs. She looked like a long-legged bear, and she was sitting near the top of her burrow a shaft she had dug straight down into the ground. The hot desert air forced her to let go with all eight of her legs. She dropped to the bottom of her shaft where the air was cooler. The spider survives the heat by digging underground and by hunting at night. So thinking about how do all these different animals survive or adapt to live in the desert? We're thinking about this now because once we get to the end of this book, we'll have a small project where we're going to be researching animals that live in the desert and how they adapt and live here in the desert. More details will come with that sooner because we're not even halfway through this book, but I want us to keep that in mind for future activities. The moist crickets and other insects that she eats quenches her thirst. A headstand beetle felt the heat of the day and became uncomfortable. He stopped hunting in the grass and scurried into the entrance of the tarantula hole. He was not afraid of the spider with her poison fangs that could kill prey, but he was wary of her. Hearing the spider coming up her shaft to see who was there, the headstand beetle got ready to fend her off. He stood on his head aimed his rear end and mixed chemicals in his abdomen. The tarantula rushed at him and lifted her things. The headstand beetle shot a blistering hot stream of a quinoid chemical at the spider. She arrived and dropped to the bottom of her den. The headstand beetle hid under a grass plant by the tarantula's door. The temperature rose several more degrees. With that, that does conclude chapter three of One Day in the Desert. Part of this illustration here, I have highlighted the headstand beetle whose head is down here, whose rear end is facing our tarantula over here, and it is spraying the tarantula with chemicals. What does this look like to you? Probably a question that you might see in your activity for today. There's about five to 10 of them for you to answer. Thank you for your time. Stay awesome and I'll see you in our next video. Bye.